Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Global Comic Safari. We got a big show for you tonight. We've been kind of slacking on the set um, builds, but we're doing a monster. Um, I got with me a monster. I got with me again, Define Triple Nine, Matt Roybal, and we are going to do Star Wars number one, 1977 ah. Marvel classic. So exciting, Woo! exciting. This is the big boy set. Uh, we've been kind of holding off on this one because it's intimidating. So, <laughs> yeah, to say the least. Oh, this is part one. Don't think part we're one. doing them all in <laughs> no. this one show. We'd, we'd, we'd be here for eight hours. We'd have Matt here all night. All right, <laughs> just a quick shout out to Comic Book Invest, CBSI. Check them out for all your best free content, comic book investing, speculation, and just general knowledge. And also thank our friends at Comic Barricade the number one solution for stabilizing your comics, preventing the dreaded spine bend. Uh, give them, use the code CBSI Tales, get 10% off along with the free shipping. So, Matt, this is it. You ready? Oh, man, dude. This is this is a crazy one, man. I, I, you know, I haven't been nervous for a show in a while, but I'm sort of nervous about this one. You're a little this nervous, is, huh? Well, because this is, you know... <laughs> There's comic book collecting, and there's hardcore comic book collecting, and then there's Star Wars collecting. In the Star Wars world, this is practically a religion. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And um, so, you know, yeah, I'm ready. I, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of people that helped us with this show. Oh, yeah, this um, was a big team effort. This is – we had to get a lot of help for this one. So I just want to name some names. Gabriel Tampolatis, Scott McManus, George the famous George from the Super Comics blog, the entire Star Wars hardcore Facebook message thread. Believe it or not, there's some really hardcore Star Wars comic book collectors that were all in a private message thread going nuts daily. But I especially want to thank Ron Rickard. That guy really knows his stuff and, you know, probably knows the most of any person that I know of when it comes to foreign Star Wars books. Without his blog and his research and his friendship, we couldn't have done this show today. So great thanks to him. And please find his blog in the show notes under our vid, because if you are even mildly interested in foreign Star Wars comics, you gotta check out Ron's blog. So thank you to all of those people. All right, yeah, awesome. It was, it was a monster of a team effort one on this one. We have one more uh, thing to do before we jump into this one. We have the giveaway from last episode that we got to follow up on. Um, so we are going to give away a Hulk 181 Russian edition and the AF-15 Russian edition. So if you guys are ready, let's do that. Okay, guys, we're going to give away the uh, Russian 181 and AF-15 donated by our good friend Steve Bridwell. Uh, we appreciate him doing this kind gesture to the community. And if you didn't check out the last pickup show with him in it, um, you really should. We entered, everybody's entered that made a comment on that show. So we put the names on the uh, spinner wheel. I'm gonna go ahead and click to see who goes. Good luck everybody. And thank you all for commenting and watching it. We really appreciate it. And there we go. All right, our winner is Theodore Mitchell. Thank you for watching. Thank you for participating. Awesome. Um, just shoot us a uh, message uh, at uh, Comics of the Norm on IG, or you can uh, reply through the comment on the link, and uh, we'll get a hold of you. Thanks, thanks, guys, and uh, thanks again, Steve, for donating such great books. And back to the show. Congratulations again to our winner, and now we're going to jump into this big bad boy. You ready, Matt? Oh shit! Am I ready? This is this is the big league stuff here. This is this is where we separate the men from the boys on Star Wars because we are going deep. Deep. <laughs> we said that at the same time. <laughs> this is it. Star Wars number one, Marvel Comics, July of nineteen seventy-seven. This book is 
iconic, classic, everything above. There were multiple printings. There's packs of them. There's reprints. There's, you know, homages for days. This thing is defines, you know, Bronze Age classic. Um, there's also that uber rare 35 cent price variant. So, I oh, mean, yeah. this book will give you insanity just as an American collector trying to get it. Yeah. You add in these forens, and oh my God, it just gets so crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, a couple stats for you on this bad boy. Um, classic Howard Chaikin cover and uh, Roy Thomas story. The census, which is actually a little lower than I'd expect, is total graded 9,577, hmm. 726 nine eights. Whoa. So a decent number. I mean, this book yeah. was probably kept very nicely for a while. People cherished it. I mean, it's it's you know, was was important when it came out, let alone as it, you know, aged. Yeah. Um, there's just under two thousand nine sixes. So quite a few out there if you're looking for a high grade copy. Just a little frame of reference that thirty five cent variant we talked about only two hundred and fifty graded. Um, highest are three nine sixes, so no nine eights. Wow. I've heard some estimates of the print run of fifteen hundred, but that's unconfirmed. It wasn't widely printed. It was just a a regional price variant because Marvel is known for trying to test the pricing structures on their comics, see if they would sell. Um, a 9.8 of the um, the big boy Star Wars is floating around of the standard, uh, about $1,600. There's some price fluctuation there, but that's a rough cost to get you a 9.8. And a 9.6 will be about 450 If you're looking for a decent raw, it's going to be probably just a tad under 100 bucks. So those yeah. are your price points. you got to watch out for all the re reprints and things like that but we're going to kind of stay out of that because there's plenty of shows for that we're going to dig into oh, yeah. the foreign lore on that so we'll save those uh variants and american stuff for for another show um why is this thing important beyond you know being star wars i mean it's star wars it's already important but yeah. to, to comics and marvel it was hugely important because it, it's been kind of quoted as being the book that that saved Marvel in the late seventies. You know, the, the sales were down, things weren't great. And uh, you know, comics were struggling. They, they weren't selling like they used to. Um, and this came about because um, there was uh, a guy named Charles Lippincott who uh, came to Marvel comics about um, talk to Stan about this film being made and wanting to do a comic tie-in. And Stan at the time was kind of hesitant because comic tie-ins don't always sell well. I mean, truthfully, if we look at it, Star Trek, all that stuff, uh, the hundreds of other kind of movie tie-ins we float around, most of them don't do great. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he lit, Charles thought he had a pretty big winner here. Um, Roy Thomas kind of stepped in and said, yeah, we really do want to do this. This looks like something that that – is a good deal, a good, interesting story to tell. He uh, saved the day. He did. So thank you, Roy Thomas, for, you know, honestly, uh, what would have happened if it didn't happen? Marvel, Marvel could have went bankrupt. Marvel could have been gone or, you know, drastically cut back. And the 80s wouldn't have been that mm -hmm. plethora of kind of comic dumb that we grew up in. So yeah. thank you, Roy. Thank you, Charles. And to a degree, thank you, Stan. But uh, Stan apparently put in this agreement to do it that, they wouldn't do any um, royalties until the comic sold 100,000 copies. <laughs> Good old Stan. Not, not that was catch a mistake. Him sleeping. Yes, well, rarely does it come out of mistake when you do that. But um, because the film was a monster and because things went nuts, you know, it sold like gangbusters. It was their, you know, biggest seller for a while in, in the late 70s, early 80s. And they hit that quota fast, which allowed, um, you know, Lucas and, and uh, Lipcott, Lippincott to come back and negotiate from a point of strength. And the royalty deal for Marvel was not nearly as good as it could have been if from the beginning they had kind of negotiated. Um, honestly, mm -hmm. if you see some of the toy deals, um, some of those companies really made out like bandits on it. But, you know, yeah. it, this just became a monster. 
So uh, Jim Shooter, the, the Marvel editor-in-chief from 78 to 87, would say in an interview that Star Wars single-handedly saved Marvel, it kept us alive. Um, I mean, you know, when when people like that are saying this is what happened, you got to you got to say it. this book is, you know, potentially put us where we are now in this in this love of comics and geekdom somewhere down the line. This is one of those things that made it all happen. Agreed. So, totally. Know, Star Wars toys, comics, all this stuff. This was our childhood. I mean, this Yeah. This was you know, if you didn't grow up playing with lightsabers or making everything you owned a lightsaber, I don't know where your childhood was. You weren't hanging out with me. That's for damn sure. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. So I think we all get the point that this is a monster of a book. Um, we're going to do something a little different this time. Beyond just showing you the covers, we're going to go into the splash page because, you know, it's an iconic image. It's um, shaken, you know, art at its best. You've got a yep. killer kind of splash page to start this whole story off. So we just kind of want to show you how that progresses through all these different iterations as well. As you know, if you're going to see it, you're going to see some of the print quality issues as well as different choices people made. So just yeah. go a little more in depth here and give Matt something else to talk about. <laughs> chew on. I need like I need more to chew on, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but it's classic. I mean, freaking everyone has seen that splash page. It's almost like burned into all of our minds. Absolutely. All right, so just to give you an idea of the set we're dealing with, here is the pick. Boom! This bad boy is big. Now, this yeah, is Matt's nice. personal set, so there are a few well, American editions in there. And I have there's some in there that I don't own, unfortunately, yes. that I had to pack in there. But, yeah, it's my, it's my personal well, set. There's a few. Plus. Yeah, there's, there's a few other Americans in there, too. But for the most part, this is – this is a, a, the foreign picture, and yeah, it's it's something special. So, I mean, you can see so many iterations, so many sizes, so many different things going on, and we're going to break this up into um, a couple different parts for you and do it a little bite size. So today we're going to cover... Um, part one. Part one. We've got uh, six books for you, so we're going to touch base on those, and we'll be back to do kind of some smaller bites because I, I don't think anyone can chew this one all at once. No, we're, we're looking at hours of content, believe <laughs> it or not. All right. Um, so we decided to start with our friends south of the border. Mexico. Mexico. Okay. This is the Mexican. It's the Clásicos del Cine, number one, no, number 299. Published by Navarro in July of 1978, so not that far off from the movie. Full color interiors. This book is in the Aguila format, which is digest size. Now, in past shows, we've talked about all the different formats that Navarro was in, but the Aguila is basically an eagle, and the eagle is small, digest size. Now, it is theorized that these smaller format sizes were necessary so that Navarro could save on paper costs. And I've heard that from multiple sources. But in the Mexican Star Wars movie run, they published the story in four issues instead of six. This means, basically, that each issue included one and a half issues. The classic shaking art here had to be shrunk down to fit into the Aguila format. So it's a little bit hard to read, but it was handled pretty well by Navarro. Now. We've often wondered why Star Wars didn't get its own title in Mexico and was instead placed into the Navarro classic movie run, which is that Clásicos del Cine. I'm not exactly sure why they did that, mate. You'd think that they might have given it its own title, but who knows? Well, um, this was a year after the American, so it had to be selling. It had to have been, yeah, and they had to have known of, of the extreme popularity. Um, let's go to the, to the splash page real quick, John. Yeah. So these are these are blown up so you can see them in comparison because obviously yes. the digest size for you. So they so yeah so they so we put them side by side so we can compare them. Now this issue isn't necessarily hard to find per se. You got to remember that Navarro printed for all of Spanish speaking America, Mexico, Central and South America combined. 
and including Spain. So print runs were quite large, we speculate. But this issue can be difficult to find in nicer conditions because the smaller format Navarro books tend to be pretty roughed up. It makes sense. Smaller digest books don't tend to survive as well or, or for as long. Um, now, sourcing this book from indigenous Mexico can also be kind of difficult because you need a solid source to help you with Mercado Libre. Mercado Libre is their eBay. So, of course, it will be a little harder, but this book will be cheaper buying it in the wild in Mexico on Mercado over American eBay. Many Mexican collectors have found out that Americans pay stupid money for certain books, and this is one of them. When this book hits American eBay, people notice and be ready to pay a premium on this book for sure. Um, go to the, the front cover again. I feel like the art here just kind of, it's kind of darker. Yeah, yeah. Notice how it's like got a bluer shift. On the, yeah, I don't on mind the... it. it. It's it's interesting to look at. So yeah, they, definitely. Good job, Jerry. they shrunk it all down. Yeah, it, they, they handled it pretty well. But I, the, if there's one negative of the Mexican Navarro to me, it's that because it's so small, because Chaikin artwork is pretty busy, right? Yes. It it like loses. It, it, I don't know. You'd have you'd have to see it side by side with a larger a larger format uh, edition. But I think that his artwork just got a little, it lost some of its punch when it shrunk down into the digest size. And I think that's something that plagues this book all along when it's printed in smaller sizes. But for, but all in all, I think they handled it pretty well. You know, it's got the Clásicos del Cine, La Guerra de las Galaxias. But they used Star Wars in there. Um, they used the little, the little Luke window of luke up in the top it's not I, I i like this issue and i like the red i love the navarro triangles and that yeah. was pretty cool well uh, yeah and uh, the, the banner's busy but other than that it is yeah it's yeah, busy you, still, and, you, know, you get what's going on yeah it, and and you know if you're building this set this is <laughs> they're all place to start a solid place to start and like i said it's it's not going to be easy but you can find one, one will pop up. Just be ready to pay a premium if you're not sourcing it from south of the border. Yeah. All right. So now we'll go to our friends to the north. You may think I'm going to do a Canadian price variant. No. <laughs> We're going to go even further and do the French Canadian edition. Yes. This is the Marvel. Troy da un la guerre des de et. I can't say it. Anyway, you get the idea. It's published by Editions Heritage in 1983 to coincide with the release of Return of the Jedi in Canada. Interiors are black and white, and this issue contains Star Wars 1, Moon Knight 1, and Power Man 50, which means what, baby? We got ourselves a double key, John. That's almost a triple. Almost a triple, but you know that Moon Knight one. Moon Knight's been getting a lot hotter lately. So if you're if you're a Moon Knight collector and a Star Wars collector, you got to almost have this book. Now Troy Daun means three in one in French. So this run featured not only Star Wars but all three of those properties. Star it's Wars, Moon Knight on the cover too. Yeah, it's you got don't always get that. No, you don't. You don't always get that. And the beauty of this of this one for me is I love the blue cover. I absolutely love it. What a cool cover choice to make as far as color, in my opinion. No, it there looks is, really sharp. It, it does. And, and the title looks sharp. The one problem with these books, though, is that unlike some of the other EH books from the early 80s in particular, those ones from 80, 81, and 82, they're a lot easier to find. But the later EH books from 83 to the mid-80s can be harder to find. And the reason we think is, according to the EH guide, it is speculated that the print runs were far lower as you get into the later 80s. Now, the reason that they did this with the EH output is by that time, comic book shops were really becoming the center of the comic book world in America and in Canada. It, they just became the center of the comic culture. We went to comic shops. By the mid-80s, we were all about comic shops. Shit, by the early 80s, we were all about comic shops. But it was really hitting there. Never forget, guys, that EH books were sold on newsstands, not in comic shops. 
So this distribution model, it hurt Editions Heritage. And it probably, not even probably, I, I can almost say for sure, contributed to their stoppage of business by the mid 80s. Because they were printing them on, you know, you were buying them on newsstands. You weren't buying them in comic shops. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they can't be found. This is another one of those ones that I'm not saying it's so rare, it's really hard to find. But it is tougher to source than a lot of the other earlier 80s output by EH. Well, and also, also you know, you got to think there's all these American editions, there's all the price variants. When you're just talking about French Canadian newsstand release books, it's probably not huge. I mean, it is, no. a, it is a popular property, but still. Exactly. And, it, you know, if you're not, if you're going to comic book shops on the reg, I mean, by that time, people were really concerned with condition and they knew that comic books that were sold on newsstands were usually beat up. I mean, it just, it had a lot of things going against it, but that's, and that's sort this, of this far back. It's also probably, they were thinking of it as a reprint. Yeah, probably. But the, the, the crazy thing about that, about this book too, you know, I'm not saying it's impossible to find, but there's another little problem <coughs> with this book. There's been some cultural issues that have popped up recently, and I know that I've talked to you about this before, John. Mm -hmm. Some French Canadian sellers have taken this attitude of not selling to Americans. Yeah, I can see and, that. And you might be like, well, how is that possible? Well, they'll still post to Canadian eBay. They'll still sell, but many will refuse to ship across the border. Now, that's kind of similarly like many American sellers refuse to ship comics internationally. I've seen that. Is it karma? Is it a nationalistic reaction by French Canadians? I think it's a little more complicated than any one single thing, but I do think that the backlash is real. I've talked to a couple of connected EH collectors and dealers, and there's definitely, I mean, the, the takeaway here is there's definitely some cultural challenges that have started plaguing the French Canadian back issue EH market, simply because a lot of outside money has gone into their back issue market. And they, you know, I, I talked to a, a Canadian collector the other day and he sold a, a, an American or I don't remember if he was American, but a collector had asked him, hey, help me find this book. He said, yeah, sure. And he found him a really nice one and it would only cost him like 40 bucks. He shipped it to him. The collector immediately took that $40 book that he bought, put it in a slab, threw it up on eBay for 500 bucks. Now, it, the, the Canadian collector wasn't saying that he, you know, it's his book. He can do whatever he wants with it. But you can't help, I think, for some of those French Canadian collectors to start to feel like they're being taken advantage of. And so I think you have this complex thing of these issues that's making the EH books harder and tougher to find. So if you're building this set and you see this EH and you think, oh, it's pretty in the 80s, it'll be easier, it'll still be around, it'll be easy to get, get it, buy it, at least use it as a placeholder because I think these are getting harder to find for a whole slew of reasons. Well, and this is probably the second biggest set built. Uh, Spider-Man, Keys, and then Star Wars. Yeah. I mean, 300 is the the daddy. This is probably the, uh, the mom or the... Uh, uncle of uh choice I mean, the uncle. a lot of set builders a lot of serious star wars fans so Let, let's see that in that splash page oh yeah so we talked about that black and white yep doesn't, and the print lose, doesn't lose a ton it's got a nice look mm -hmm. to it and they the printing's good quality and it you know it just is you know all the black and whites are going to lose something when they when they go over but it, it was handled really well yeah, um agree. it's a it's a great book you know um if you see it, buy it because, like I said, these are getting harder to find. All right, so now we got a twofer out of our friends across the ocean, um, the Greeks, who you know, their books we talk about all the time being really tough books. So yes, oh boy, ooh, this is a biggie. This is the first Greek seventy-seven too. So yep, this this is this is a biggie. Um, and it basically says on, on the title, Stars Wars, and I'll get to that in a second. Number one was published in December of 1977 by Cabanas Hellas. 
wasn't too long after the American release. The interiors are full color and black and white. Every other spread is black and white. The color pages, though, have a unique emphasis on the blue coloring. Have you seen any of these Cabanas books, John? Do you have any of these ones? I do not yet. They're, the full color pages, at least on some of the books, have like this. It's like they went heavy on the blue. It's kind of weird. Um, Let's splash. Fr fresh yeah, go to the back. splash. Go to the splash. See how it's full color? But do you notice how the blue is like more dominant? Yes. It's, a, it's just a weird thing like that. Um, okay, so included in this issue is Star Wars 1 and 2, Kid Cult Outlaw 161, 45, and 60. Now, the Cabanas Hellas Marvels are a unique and funky group of books, and their Star Wars 1 is absolutely no different. For starters, this particular issue had some major production defects. Like many books Cabanas put out at the time, these defects, we see them all over the place. And these particular defects trouble most copies of this issue either a miscut on the right side or a weird registration issue related to the miscut, okay? So if we look at the, look at that scan, do you notice how on the lower right corner, you see it like at an angle going up to the top right? Yeah. It's off by like an eighth of an inch. Huh. And so what happens there is the cutter that cuts them just was off. And in some copies, it's so bad that the, that the angle up at the top it even goes beyond the bleed, so it's just white, right? Uh -huh. So but, it's really weird. So, so if you can find really it, common, um, I, I, I've seen them on almost all of the of the issues. I did see one that I think had the cut that instead of veering to the right, veered to the left. Huh. But honestly, I can't say I've ever seen a square, a, an actual square one. If you can find a square one, you've hit pay dirt, my friend. <clears throat> I mean that that's a I've never seen one. Um, okay, so a really fun title makes this edition so neat as well. The publisher put the Greek translation within the English shadow. Why didn't they just yeah. create a new shadow? That's weird, right? Also, the translation of this title is funky as hell. Directly translated, the title reads Stars Wars instead of Star Wars. So... That's kind of weird. This issue is definitely funky. Now, according to my Greek experts, this book had a print run of between 5 and 6K, which is tiny. Also, this issue did not sell as well as other Cabanas titles at the time. And so it only made it to issue 9, John. Wow. Yeah. C Cabanas was famous for discontinuing a title if sales were poor and adjusting the print runs down in later in the run. So this book is going to give some foreign hunters fits, especially if you're looking for a cleaner copy. Because the Cabanas Hellas are famous for just being trashed. They're trashed. And like I said, um, it only made it to issue nine. So this book did not sell well. It wasn't one of their bigger sellers. Um, Spider-Man sold better. Kung Fu, Master of Kung Fu sold better, I believe. It just didn't do very well. It, it's in that group with... Uh, I believe Howard the Duck and Iron Man that didn't get a, very many issues. And so the print runs were smaller and any that were left on the stand got returned and they either got tomed by the Greek publisher Cabanas or they got pulped. And uh, yeah, this is, this is going to be one of the tougher ones to find. You're going to have to have people in Greece source them. If you wait around and wait for one on American eBay, especially now that more awareness is coming to the foreign market, be ready to pay a premium. You're going to be better off having a Greek hunter hunt it for you, I think. But I, I love this issue. Do, do you like this one, John? Well, I mean, the, uh, it's always fun to see the Greek. I, it, yeah. It's just the way the language is and, and the, the it, it just looks so foreign to us. And yeah. I mentioned that kind of cover where they kept the shape, but just crammed those words in. It, it's, it's interesting how they did it. Um, you know, and the coloring is a little bit darker it's not sharper but a little darker almost so it it, it very it's very red yeah it is very, you know what i think it is is by throwing the greek translation into the english shadow they added so much more red that now our eyes just see red so we're like focused on all the red everywhere i do dig the star wars logo down in the bottom corner yeah that's cool 
So I, it's a it's a very eye appealing book. But I say that about all the Greek ones. I, I don't know why they just they just hit you well. Yeah, but, it's that lettering. Let's get back to that splash. They handled it pretty well. You know, I mean, it does have that really kind of heavy heavy blue. No, it's just it's, weird. It's it's alien to look at. It just makes the word the wording just makes it so alien to us that it just throws us off. Oh, totally. But it, I mean, this is a great book. Cabanas Hellas books gotta have them. You gotta find if you're a hardcore Star Wars one collector, you gotta find this book. I hate it's a beautiful doing, one. I hate doing these shows. You make me buy books I wasn't gonna <laughs> buy. Dude, you got this is one. This is one you got to kind of have, dude. And, it, you know, and the thing I like about this one, too, is it was printed so close to the American, you know? Oh, yeah. They didn't wait very long. No. So we talked about it. You get yep. two from this country. Woo! We get a twofer. Twofer. So. Okay. 1981, second, four years 1981. later. 1981. Second Greek. Uh, a lot of people kind of call this the black Um and I think they call, they call it that because there was a, uh, an, I think it was an Italian story uh, comic called Black, and Black was started out in this title. I don't even know how to pronounce it. I think that that Greek lettering means black, but I'm not for sure. So I'm so I'm just going to call it what I think is the Black sixty five. It was published by Piridokos Tipos in March of nineteen eighty one. The interiors are spot color magenta, and they're handled pretty well. <clears throat> now, the Star Wars movie adaption on this one was spread over seven issues from Black 65 to 71. For this reason, each issue does not contain a complete issue from the Marvel comic. So, for instance, this example of Black 65 contains Star Wars 1 minus the last page. Huh. So the pub spread the story out by one issue. So these books, yeah. So isn't that interesting? So you like you get the whole story, but you get that last page. So you know, maybe it makes you wanting more, better. I, I don't know. These books are also digest size, which again can make finding nicer copies a little bit difficult. And Black was a weekly digest size comic. Okay, and as as I said, it was named after that Italian comic. The first volume ran for four hundred and twenty eight issues. Oh, jeez. In 1977, the second volume began and ran for 120 issues. And finally, in 1979, the third volume began and ran for, get this, John, 756 issues until 1994. Oh, goodness gracious. Now, there's a reason why. And the reason is this comic was published weekly, bro. It was published oh. weekly. Oh, yeah. So that'll get there fast, huh? That'll get there fast. So Still added 15 pub- years. It's a, just imagine weekly having to go, if you like this series, having to go pick them up. Um, so at its publication peak in the Greek comic world, the circulation of this series would reach 130 copies, 130,000 copies. Oh, wow. So it was quite popular. So with that being said, logic would assume this book could be found everywhere, right? Well, I probably thought of as disposable. Yeah. So go go check out the splash page on this baby. Look at that beautiful magenta splash. Okay. That would be wrong. You can't find it everywhere. For some darn reason, Star Wars set builders have had a hell of a time finding copies of this book. You know, we used to see copies on average hit eBay at least a few times a year. Different, you know, you, you would see them. But recently, copies have dried up. And we're like, where the hell did all these books go? Well, guess what? Exactly today, I was talking with my Greek contact. Okay. Hot off the presses, breaking news. According to my Greek contact, who now works for the grandson of the Greek publisher that published the Black, apparently sometime in the mid-90s, so remember, this this, this uh, title went to like 94, that incarnation of the publisher at the time went out of business and all the back stock and return stock from the from that publisher was destroyed by sending it to a paper pulper hmm. could this be why these damn little books are so damn hard to find 
I think it's a good theory because, you know, a lot of these books on the foreign markets, publishers would get stuff returned to them. A lot of the foreign publishers would tome them, which toming basically means binding. So they take new old backstock and they would bind them and then they would resell them or sell them to news agents or to sell them in bulk, get them out of there. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, in Greece, a lot of these publishers would just pulp them. I don't know if they got like, you know, kind of like money, uh, you know, like kind of like uh, incentives. Yeah, incentives for uh, repurposing paper or, you know, recycling paper. I don't know why they, you know, because Cabanas did it too. A lot of shit got pulped at Cabanas. But to think that just boxes and boxes and boxes of old backstock and old return stock of these black runs were just destroyed. It breaks my heart, John. Yeah, I I get it. That's what so it makes it fun though. I want to jump yeah. back to the cover for a moment because yeah, let's go back to the cover. It's there with the the photos. You got the the Luke and the Leia photos there, which is yeah, different. yeah. They replaced the the Chaken Luke with a photo, and they they threw Leia down there into the where the UPC would have been, and then they gave it a funky like you know if you saw that you think oh there must be a stamp on that book. That's not a stamp. That's that's printed on there. Oh, I thought it was a stamp. <laughs> no, uh -oh. it's huh. printed on there. And, I, it's, and I'm not exactly sure what it says in Greek. Greek. Maybe it says Star Star Wars. I, I I don't know. But I do like that they use the American title, and you know the the black or the whatever that says in yellow. It has a pop to it. And this is another one where by adding a different color, adding that green, kind of. The differentiates it. Yeah, it differentiates it in the set, which I like. I like I like differentiation. All right. So, you know, we've been talking about this one's sort of tough, this one's sort of tough, this one's sort of tough. I don't know why it feels like a lot of the Star Wars are tough. Probably <laughs> just popularity, less floating around. Yeah. But now we're we're hitting one of the real the real, real tough of the set. So Oh boy. South Africa. Let us all bow down to the South African super comics. Because this this freaking book, I mean, for a long for the longest time. I'll get into that in a second. So buckle up, John. Call I'm, I'm ready. Buckle up. Buckle you, up. You you talked me into one of these a few years ago. So oh, and you're a lucky, you're a lucky guy. <laughs> so South African. This is the South African Super Comic Star Wars, published by Republican Press. In 1977, another one that was very close. This book is full color, and this book includes the full movie adaption. So that's issues one and six, a one through six. I mean, it's almost a trade paperback. It's okay. 116 pages, it says on the cover. It's a monster. It's a monster. This book is quite large. Now, before we get into this book specifically, I'd like to talk about Republican Press as a publisher real quick. This publisher got its start in 1960 with photo comics. They got their start with picture comics instead of normal comics. So what, what that is, is they're pictures instead of comic art panels. And word balloons were laid over the top of photos. So this made Republican press very popular um, in South Africa. Okay, they, they had a lot of stuff very popular. Um, so it makes sense that when actual comics got licensed over there, that it would go to them, okay? So from 1976 to 1984, Republican Press printed American comics for South African readers under their Super Comics imprint, which they dubbed South African's own comics. Now, the stories were from publishers, DC, Marvel, Charlton, Harvey, Goldkey. They did everything, right? And these would include the first Marvel stories published in South Africa. So it's only natural during this era when U.S. pop culture was invading South African televisions, movies, and comics that somebody would decide to do Star Wars and somebody would decide to do Marvel Star Wars. Now, the indicia says that the comic is published by Super Comics and printed by Republican Press. Now, it's not clear why this comic uses the two-word Super Comics. See up on the, on the banner up there, John? It's yeah. a Super Comics. A whole bunch of later books, they just condensed it into super comics and it wasn't two words. So we're not quite sure why they did that. Maybe they were just starting to figure out what their what their logos were going to be and all that stuff. We're not quite sure. But it was definitely an early comic in the line. 
Okay, so the cover. The cover is the same as the US cover for Star Wars 1, but the UPC box has been replaced with a blurb that reads, the complete film in one fabulous 116-page comic, just like you said, and the blurb on the U.S. cover, you know, that, that little part under the box yeah, right there, it reads, special souvenir issue on this issue. Okay? Now, that's important. And the reason why it's important is that this book hit the stands in South Africa one month, John, one month. This was not a book that had multiple issues come out over a period of time. This was one issue that hit the stands on that month. So if you were a kid in South Africa and you missed it, you missed it. It wasn't <laughs> like it was coming back or it wasn't like you were ready for it even. You know, when a comic has multiple issues, one, two, three, four, five, people, people, you know, start kind of preparing for it and start buying the run. Or just, this only hit it one time. And not only that, this comic was expensive. Oh, it I mean, was you're one fifty rand. It's like a book. Yeah, it, it, it's it, so it'd probably be like the difference between buying a trade paperback in a comic book store and buying a comic. It was like three or four times more expensive. So the word on the street from my from my South African collector friends and and experts is that this book didn't sell well. So a lot of them probably got returned. Oh, and printed so early, the movie may not have really. It may not have been, it quite that far as may fast. not have been so hot either, and that's kind of a weird thing, right? So there's a lot of little reasons to make this book hard to find. Now, much, <coughs> much later, you know, now we're in, you know, where there's a lot of people hunting foreigns and definitely a lot of people within these countries that know people are looking for these books. A lot more have popped out in the last couple of years. Early on, I only knew of three in the United States and no more. And it was like that for a few years. But a lot more have popped out. So it has gotten easier to find. But, no, but condition is still tough. Because condition is still tough. 160 yep. pages. I've got a, a nice eye appeal copy. I mean, not great, but nice. But a page is detached. I mean, it, it's they pop out. I mean, it's 116 pages. Yeah, I mean, and over time... You, you know, that that glue, the bind, I mean, it, yeah, you're going to end up with, with rough copies. Um, and I think your copy is the only slabbed copy I've ever seen. That's the only one I'm aware of yet. So we'll see. Let's look at the splash. Okay. Okay, so for the splash, pretty much, you know, same as American. But again, we see this blue shift. A little bit color differences. Well, everything's really kind of sharp on these. Like the color is, the intensity is high. The the mm -hmm. logo is high. The the all of it's high. So they kind of almost turned it up on all the stuff. Because even look at the boxes are kind of faint green on the U.S. And here it's that blue is is yeah. kind of heavy. Yeah, it's almost like they went really like heavier on the ink. So the yeah. interior might actually be better, you know, on in some regard. Um, and they threw you know up on the top the chapter one Tatooine, and I think as you go to the the different chapters, the different issues that are included, you get that same thing. Now, there's one other thing before we leave this book. Now, bear with me. I want to bullshit a little bit here. Okay. Now, I, I say this for a lot of South African books, that the South African Republican press books were on the right side of history. Okay? Not only is this book a Star Wars one, but this book is special for another reason, a cultural reason. And that is that everyone knows that apartheid was, you know, just – one of the worst governments uh, in the modern era, you know, apartheid was horribly racial, horribly just, you know, this whole two systems, but equal crap. I mean, it was, it was, it was horrible. Um, and, you know, you had censors in South Africa that were trying to keep the African populations below the white populations. And they did not like when magazines or movies or anything showed the races mixing, right? The races were not supposed to mix. So on most, on most like high order stuff, like, you know, South African TV, uh, the high end magazines, um, there was, you know, kind of tended to be a white version and a black version, right? So you might have like a popular daytime soap opera, but there was a white one and a black one. 
You might have had like a popular magazine, like Home and Garden magazine or some bullshit. There'd be a white one and a black one. Um, but the thing about comics is the censors, everyone kind of saw, uh, you know, comic books as throwaway entertainment. It wasn't anything that was going to stick around for a long time. The censors couldn't censor everything, right? Yeah. So Republican press would have these competitions within their pages. There would be posters, and they would have little kids send in pictures of themselves, and uh, they would win things like Walkmans and, and uh, post uh, more posters, um, all kinds of just funky stuff. And what makes the Republican press comics so special in my mind was they chose to not separate the races. And on those posters, on those winning, where they showed all the winners, they showed African kids and white kids. And well, white kids, they'd be South Africans, but you get what I'm saying. They would show all the races. It didn't matter if you were a mixed race. It didn't matter if you're a full African. It didn't matter if you were, you know, white skinned. Didn't matter if you were Asian. Didn't matter. Your picture was going up there with the winners. And so for me, I feel like Republican press was on the right side of history because they didn't follow what the government of South Africa was trying to make all the people making media uh, to follow. They were showing all the races, mixed races, all together, all as one group of people, as comic book collectors, as kids that were winning these, these uh, free giveaways and stuff. And so I think this book is on the right side of history and it's not just a Star Wars one. It is a cultural piece of the downfall of apartheid that makes this book special if you see this book in any condition buy it absolutely don't be a fool don't be a fool you see this book in any condition buy it because lots of people are hunting it and yes more have popped out but it is still not easy to find baby this no, is and, and the copies that i've seen many are not that nice there, this is a we had the well. Think about it, John. We were trying to find a good copy. This was the nicest copy we could find. This is Scott McManus's copy, and uh, yeah, nice copies of this aren't out there. No, well, the last one I saw then the group purchase had like a a, a, a tear on, like uh, damage to the cover. So, yeah, they're yeah. tough. And mine's only a one five or one eight because of that detached page. They're just it's a tough, tough book. It's a tough, tough book. You find it, buy it. All right, so this one is this is one of those top, top, top ones. We've kind of s broken up the the series to, to have one of those in each. Even yes. though many of these books are not as easy as we want, um, this one's the monster of this group. Yep, this is a star. And you know, we like to give you a little bit extra when we do this show. We're gonna give you we're gonna give you some a bonus book, an mm -hmm. oddity as we like to call it. Oddity, baby. This is the French Tele Junior. See, <laughs> I'm horrible at French. Tele Junior 3, published by Tele Junior on November of 1977. So, this is another one that was extremely close. Um, go to the splash page on this one, John. Yes. Look at that. It's a little, you, you might be wondering, what the hell? Black right? and white. It's black and white. But it's what the actually... hell is that? And it's insert. actually a supplement insert. So Tele Jr. had all kinds of stories built into it. It was, you know, it almost reminds me of like a, you know, like Highlights magazine yeah. that you find in like dentist offices and shit that have like it have like puzzles and it have stories. This one, this one's had Spider-Man, Scooby-Doo. I don't know the exact stories in this one. Um, I added this one a little late. Um, but this one, you know, it's got most of the cover there. What do you think of that cover, John? It's, it's you know, got some pieces, and it takes out Vader, drops in 3PO, so it's an interesting choice. Yeah, it's very interesting. And, and Luke is still there, but that's it. But, you know, there's something else that's interesting about Luke. Let me see if you, if you see it. He's backwards. Mm-hmm. There's no lightsaber, right? And no. he's backwards, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Is he backwards? Maybe it just looks it. 
No, he's not. No, back. he's there. But no, look, look at his hand. There's no lightsaber, man. You're right. That's why I think I, my brain is saying backwards because it's not yeah. there. It's not there, and it looks like they colored his hand so that it just was down. So maybe because this was a children's book, they didn't want to show him with a weapon. Well, then maybe that's why they went with the old uh, robot up front. And that's maybe that's why they removed Vader. That's why they threw in C three PO. They were just kind of making it more kid friendly. But the thing about this book is, the Tella Juniors pop up, but finding them with the supplement not detached. I have seen these for sale where the supplement's detached but still in the book. And I have seen them for sale without the supplement because it was pulled out. So this one, you know, you can find it. It's not hard to find. It just might be harder to find one that's complete and on the nicer side because this is another one. It's a kid's magazine. It's a kid's magazine, exactly. Kids are going to destroy it. So if you, you see, see a nice collectible than a comic. Exactly. Who collects highlights? I don't know anyone that does. <laughs> um, I'm guessing some do, but so you know, this is another one. You're gonna hear me say it all the time because I'm a set I'm a Star Wars one set builder, so I guess I'm kind of biased. You see this freaking book, buy it, right? <laughs> if you see if you see this book in nicer condition with the with the insert still attached, buy it. Well, that's also one if you're if you're shopping, you gotta ask. You better make sure before you pay for it to be shipped over from France or wherever the heck you find it. You don't want to spend twenty bucks to, to find out later. Oh heck, the part I want's missing. Yep, that just happened to our buddy Steve. He didn't oh. ask. And so, you know, ignorance isn't bliss on this issue. You've got to ask. Make sure that insert is in there. Otherwise it's incomplete. I'm gonna show you that picture again so you know what yep. you're looking for. Make sure it's in there. And, and, you know, some, some sellers sell them with the insert attached. That's better than nothing. Yeah. I mean, of course, you'd want it attached if possible. But very cool book. Needs to be in your set. Kind of funky. Removed the lightsaber. Altered the artwork. I like it. This is a good oddity. Exactly. Cool colors. Scooby-Doo. Sp Spider-Man. He kind of got a little bit of everything there. Oh, and, 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 early and, listen, and listen to this. I don't know about this particular issue. But I know that on some subsequent issues, the Spider-Man stories were redrawn by a famous Belgian-French artist. Huh. I think uh, my buddy was telling me that on one of the issues later, I think it's six or seven, uh, one of the early Spider-Man stories, I think, it, I think he said it was 53. I don't remember the exact number, but it was completely redrawn by a French artist, maybe because there was stuff in there that was considered violent. So maybe they got the license and they said, that's a little bit too violent. Let's just have our French artists tame it down. You know what I mean? A bit. All right. So that makes them interesting as well to Marvel fans. All right. So we gave you a lot of content. As we said, this is a monster of a set to build. I'm going to flashback to it. Look um, at that. I mean, just kind of pointing it out, seeing some of the sizes we talked about, seeing the digest books, seeing this Tele Junior being a bit bigger. Um, lots of color choices, lots of countries included, and many of them are difficult countries. It's not, you know, you're not seeing a lot of the easy countries. There's some of them, but tough, tough book. Oh yeah. We will, we will follow up with part two. Not next. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna tease you with it and make you come back again. Yeah. But, uh, this, this, as we said, it takes a lot of research on this particular book. So it's such a large set, so much information. Um, but we will follow up with part two soon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thank you for watching. Matt, thank, you. thank you for uh, only rambling for about an hour, which is impressive because I thought we would be at two hours on this first one. Did I, did I, I told myself down a little you were, bit. You were on point today. Good, good, good. I wanted to be. This is a, you know, this is, this is kind of a labor of love for me uh, as far as sets. This is, this is a set that I can honestly say, I might have a custom uh, casket built <laughs> and, and that custom casket's going to have like these clear. Uh, so hopefully I'm going to have an open casket. <laughs> First of all, the casket's going to have like the whole set, right? From the American and everything. And it's going to just work its way around me. You, you might want to like, run this by your wife. I don't know how that's going <laughs> to go. Just, just yeah. saying. I'm going to tell Heather, we need to invest a little bit more in the custom casket that's going to be built with all my Star Wars one set all around me. Maybe we can put uh, something there. You we'll know, maybe put the super comics on top of it. We'll put the super comics on top of it. Yeah, exactly. 
It's gruesome. <laughs> all right. Oh, Thank gosh. you all for joining. I will uh, see you next time. And uh, check out our friends at comicbookinvest.com. Thank you.